Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you all for sharing your time with us today. My name is Suzanne Nasser, and I'm a full-time um, faculty member in the Counseling and Career Development Center. I'm also the chair of the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Awareness Committee that runs out of the Counseling, um, counseling Center. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Sharon Brennan, who's in the back there um, setting up our resource table. She also serves on the um, Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Awareness Committee with me. Um, and I'd also like to thank Amal Jarad, um, who is not here today, but also serves on that committee. On behalf of the One Book, One College Committee and the Counseling and Career Development Center, I'd like to welcome you all to our panel, Following a Sexual Assault, Information for You or Your Loved One. This panel will focus on how to support survivors following a sexual assault and will include perspectives from our wonderful panelists, here, who are a group of advocates, health professionals, and college staff. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to acknowledge that a couple of my colleagues from the Counseling Center are here with us today in the audience. Um, Anna Coco, if you wouldn't mind standing up and saying hello to everyone. Um, I believe Teresa Hannon is either here or on her way, and Shania as well, and of course, I already, and Shania's right here to the left of me, and Sharon Brennan is here as well. Um, you know, we understand that this topic is not an easy one to discuss, and I want to emphasize that our intention in unpacking the dynamics of sexual assault um, and having an open and honest dialogue about it really is to create a sense of community, to build support and safety for all of you. This is not to undermine or to minimize the fact that this topic is a heavy one, perhaps a scary and emotional one for some of you. So please, if you feel the need to see one of our counselors, they are here and they are ready to support you. Also, at the end of this panel, please feel free to pick up um, on your way out. We have a resource table um, at the entrance of the library, so please feel free to pick up some resources for you or a friend. Um, before I turn it over to our panelists, and thank you for being so patient, um, I thought it might be helpful for us to set the tone and the context for today's discussion um, by sharing a few statistics and um, defining some terms. Last week, Sharon and I did a um, presentation right here in the workshop, but we understand that some of you um, were probably not in attendance. And so to kind of put things into context, um, again, I thought it might be helpful to share um, some information. Um, so some statistics as they relate specifically to college students, so not the general population, okay? Um, we know that one in five, so anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of women um, on college campuses are sexually assaulted. One in 16 men are sexually assaulted while in college. One in four transgender students have experienced a sexual assault since enrolling in college. And we know that more than 90% of sexual assault victims on college campuses do not report the assault. So these statistics are significant um, for many reasons, right? Um, but just to kind of name a couple of reasons why they're um, significant is, um, one, our motto in the counseling department is that one victim or one survivor of sexual assault is one too many, okay? The other reason why these statistics stand out is that um, we, um, we want to focus in on the fact that um, it's th that they're an underreported, um, it's an underreported crime. And there are many reasons as to why survivors of sexual assault um, do not come forward. One of them is that they're afraid that they're not going to be believed. The other is that um, they don't know where to turn for help. And so one of the main reasons and the main focuses of today's um, workshop is to arm you with some information on who you can turn to for support. Uh, the other reason why these statistics are significant is we know that if um, our students are impacted by sexual assault or any kind of trauma, really, um, it impacts your ability to do well here in school, right? You can't concentrate in your classes. You start to struggle with um, attending classes or being fully present when you are here. Um, and so we want you to know who you can turn to, where those supports are, um, and we hope that you find that information uh, to be uh, valuable. 
so let's just look at some um, definitions before we get started with our panel. Um, so sexual assault is any type of sexual contact or behavior that occurs without the explicit consent of the recipient. So sexual assault is kind of like the umbrella term, okay? And it includes things like attempted rape, it includes fondling or unwanted sexual touching, forcing a victim to perform sexual acts such as oral sex or penetrating the perpetrator's body, penetration of the victim or survivor's body, uh, which is also known as rape, right? So again, we said sexual assault is the umbrella term. Rape is a form of sexual assault, but not all sexual assault is rape. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Um, consent. Consent is an agreement between participants to engage in sexual activity. It's about communicating, right, with your partner. Um, and this should happen every time, all the time. Um, so giving consent for one activity, one time, does not mean that you're giving consent for increased or reoccurring sexual contact. So for example, if you agree to kiss someone, that does not mean that you're also giving them permission to remove your clothes. Having sex with someone in the past doesn't give permission, doesn't give that person permission to have sex with you again in the future. So consent is ongoing and you should be constantly and consistently checking in with your partner, making sure that they're feeling comfortable wha with what's happening, making sure that they're okay with moving on to another form of activity, sexual activity or intimate activity, okay? Rape culture is a term that defines the way in which society blames victims of sexual assault and normalizes sexual violence. So this was a, um, a term that was coined here in the US in the 1970s by feminists to basically demonstrate and illustrate the way um, that um, society continues to blame survivors of sexual assault and normalize sexual violence. Rape culture includes things like um, jokes, um, it includes things like raping the victim. It includes some of the things that we see on the media where we are incessantly blaming the survivor, saying things like, you know, well, questioning what she was wearing. Why was she out at that time of the night? Why, and I don't mean to say she, excuse me, I wanna back up, because we know that survivors of um, sexual assault, that sexual assault does not discriminate based on one's uh, race, religion, socioeconomic status, or sexual orientation, right? But being critical of the media's message, right, is also part of rape culture or breaking down rape culture because oftentimes they're questioning the timing of the report, right? Or saying, well, this, the, um, why, are, why is this individual coming now to report this? It seems a little suspicious. So all of that embodies um, rape culture. With that said, um, so I hope that's set just a little bit of a context for the framework um, of our panel today. And with that said, I would like to welcome our five panelists. Um, I have them here um, in alphabetical order just because I thought that that would be easiest. So I'm gonna start with Heather Casillo. Heather Casillo has been working at Moraine Valley for almost uh, two years now as a nursing instructor. She graduated from Moraine Valley's nursing program in 2009 and then went on to secure her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing in 2012 through Sh Chamberlain College of Nursing. In 2015, Heather earned her Master's of Science in Nursing at Benedictine University. She has spent almost 10 years working as an emergency room trauma nurse at, is it Amita? Amita Glen Oaks Hospital. About six years ago, Heather became, a certif uh, became certified as a sexual assault nurse examiner, and she's gonna bring some of that experience um, to today's uh, panel. So thank you, Heather. Next, we have uh, Michelle Furlow. Michelle has been working at Moraine Valley since 2010 and is our college's emergency preparedness and Homeland Security certificate coordinator. A bit of a tongue twister there. And she's also a criminal justice faculty member. Michelle studied criminology at, at the University of Alabama and Indiana University. She has a law enforcement background and an interest in understanding law enforcement's response to sexual assault. 
Michelle also has a strong research background in post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, she has plans to share some of that with us today. So thank you, Michelle. Next, we have Dr. Joanne Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins is currently serving as Dean of Student Success and is also the Title IX Coordinator here at the college. She has been with Moraine Valley since May of 2007 and has held various roles within higher education for over 20 years in both two-year and four-year institutions. She has developed a unique sensitivity to diverse student populations and is committed to building a learning community that serves all students. In her role as Title IX Coordinator, she has the primary responsibility for coordinating the college's efforts to comply with and carry out its responsibilities under the federal and state Title IX legislations, which prohibits, so this is what Title IX is, okay? It prohibits sex discrimination in all the operations of this college, as well as retaliation for the purpose of interfering with any right or privilege secured by Title IX. She earned her Doctor of Education in Adult and Higher Education from National Lewis University, her Master's in Educational Administration from Governor State University, and, a, and her Bachelor's in Behavioral Sciences from National Lewis University. Welcome, Dr. Jenkins. Next, we have Jane Klingberg. Um, Jane Klingerd has her master's degree in education and is here to give us um, the survivor's perspective. She is a survivor of an on-campus sexual assault. Jane has had multiple roles here at the college, including being a part-time counselor, continuing education and corporate trainer, and student support services case manager. She is currently working as an adjunct faculty member teaching psychology courses and is actively employed as a consultant and career counselor. When not working, Jane likes to be with her family, garden, travel, kayak, and play Pokemon Go. Last but certainly not least, and someone who's no stranger um, to Moraine Valley is uh, Patty Murphy. Patty Murphy has her master's degree in criminal and social justice from Lewis University and is also a certified alcohol and drug counselor for the state of Illinois. Patty serves as the director of advocacy and prevention education at Pillars, where she has been employed for the past 22 years. Patty also has a private practice on the southwest side of Chicago, where she counsels persons with substance use disorders. She serves on a multitude of committees and task force including the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault Governing Body and Program Committee, a member of the Cook County State's Attorney's Sexual Assault Advisory Group, Legal Assistance Foundation's Class Project Partner, the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless Part Committee, and the Proviso Children's Advocacy Center's multidisciplinary team. So she brings a wealth of experience um, and expertise with her today, and we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to also be with us today. So welcome to all of you. Um, we certainly are grateful to the contributions you all are going to be making, and we look forward to hearing from each of our panelists. Following the presentations, we will open up um, for Q&A. I see some of you um, are already taking notes, so if you have a question, jot it down. We will be entertaining questions at the end of the panel. And again, please remember, if this topic or this discussion brings up difficult emotions for anyone, um, our counselors are here um, and ready and available to support you, okay? Um, and so with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to start with Patty. Um, Patty, if you can give us just a little bit of information about what Pillars does to support um, survivors of sexual assaults. All right. Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, thank you, I, and I um, am thrilled to be here today. Uh, so, Pillars is your local rape crisis center. We are a member of the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault. In, across the state of Illinois, there's 29 rape crisis centers. Um, all of the 29 centers provide the seven core services and standards for survivors in Illinois, um, which include uh, a 24-hour sexual assault hotline, medical advocacy, criminal justice advocacy, uh, other advocacy, institutional efforts, activism and awareness, professional training, prevention education, um, information referral and so those are the core seven services so even if you call 
our hotline here uh, in Hickory Hills, and you live or have a family member that lives in Carbondale, uh, we will be able to provide you a resource in Carbondale that will provide you the same supportive services that you would re uh, receive here in our service area. So Pillars, we have a 24-hour sexual assault hotline. Now, that is a conduit for all of our services. So survivor services, significant others, other professionals, as well as medical, criminal justice, and uh, educational institutions. Um, so what we provide through that hotline, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is immediate response within 15 minutes um, of a call for service. So for example, if you are looking for uh, support groups in the area, or you are looking for information even on a, uh, for a class uh, research paper, give us a call. Um, you will phone our hotline within 15 minutes. You will get a call back from an advocate um, that will provide you resources, options, crisis intervention, uh, as well as, um, I'm trying to think of what else we do on there. Um, okay. The medical so advocacy, right. right, for survivors of right. sexual assault. So also, we work with seven area hospitals. Uh, we provide on-site crisis intervention and advocacy to seven areas, seven hospitals in the area. So it's McNeil, LaGrange, Loyola, Westlake, Oak Park, Gottlieb, and Metro South. So those are the, our contracted hospitals. What happens is um, when a victim of sexual assault or childhood sexual abuse prevent, present in the emergency room to get treated for injuries or have evidence collected, they phone our hotline and an advocate will be dispatched to the emergency room within an, within an hour. Um, we also work with all of our SANE nurses, all of our doctors, law enforcement, and state's attorneys uh, to ensure that all of our survivors have options going forward after their assault, as well as provide resources and follow-up. We provide uh, criminal justice advocacy to 38 com suburban communities. Um, so they also use the 24-hour hotline as a conduit to access on-site legal advocacy services. So if someone, even whether it was a late disclosure or it was a recent sexual assault, and they go and report the crime, they will phone our hotline and an advocate will be dispatched on site within an hour to provide um, support and advocacy to our survivor uh, and their families. We provide other advocacy through our sexual assault hotline, whereas if a survivor uh, would like a civil no contact order, which is a stay away order specific for sexual assault survivors. So we mirrored our civil no contact order very much like the order of protection domestic violence order of protection. The only caveat to that is if you're a victim of sexual assault, there does not have to be an int intimate partner or family relationship. Um, you, it could be an acquaintance rape situation, it could be um, a, a stra uh, stranger assault, it could be whomever, and all you need to do is have an advocate assist you with filing a petition to get a 21-day uh, order so the assailant will stay away. Um, we also provide individual counseling, ages three and up. Um, we serve uh, child sexual abuse survivors, adult survivors of sexual abuse and incest, and adult sexual assault survivors. Um, all of our services are free. Um, you don't hear that every day. As well as we offer bilingual, bicultural um, therapy, advocacy, and prevention education in both Spanish and Arabic. Uh, we as well through our hotline, we will um, provide information to other professionals in regards to um, coming on site and doing trainings. Uh, we work, we have a prevention educator that will talk with uh, young people ages three and up in regards uh, to personal safety, assertiveness, support systems, uh, lures that predators use to gain our trust as well as then we do junior high, high school, sexual harassment, dating violence, um, sexual health, um, sexual assault, and as well as training to other first responders on how to work with um, survivors and significant others. Um, we have a program, uh, which I, I'll probably talk about a little bit later, which we call the, um, which we're providing free pro bono civil legal services and assistance to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and 
this is one of the first in the state, I don't know about the country, but the state, where just identifying as a survivor, we have, I believe, five uh, civil legal attorneys uh, appointed to this project, where if you, have, you need um, uh, domestic violence survivors uh, seeking a divorce or visitation uh, rights, or foreclosure, or bankruptcy, assistance with getting on public benefits, immigration, um, it runs the gamut. So um, this is a, a service open to all survivors, whether uh, you, it was a childhood trauma or a recent trauma, um, where you can call our hotline and access um, free, again, free, pro bono civil legal services, which is very difficult to find. Um, okay, I think, ah! I forgot one thing, okay. We also have um, agreements with uh, six area local um, universities and colleges where we're providing to, for example, Moraine Valley, um, as well as Morton College in Cicero, St. Xavier University, uh, Trinity Christian College, Concordia University and Dominican University where we're providing um, access to on-site crisis intervention, and advocacy and counseling to all students, faculty members, um, anyone here on campus that needs support, um, as well as free professional training to faculty, staff, um, public safety, uh, professional uh, public education, as well as hopefully you'll be seeing our, our you or have seen our hotline posters all over and more awareness and. Um, awareness activities and events for the students and faculty here at Moraine. I think I covered it all. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> as, as you all can see or hear, right, um, Pillars is really a nice complement to the work that we do here in the counseling department. Uh, many of us in the counseling department are specifically trained uh, to work with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. There's a specific certification. Patty talked a little bit about that, um, and many of us are, but some of the things that we don't offer that Pillars does that Patty highlighted, right, is that medical advocacy for survivors, that court advocacy, that 24-hour hotline. So what they do is they kind of complement the work that and the, and the counseling that we do here by providing some services that at a community college level right we don't have access to and so we're grateful to be able to turn to them and to refer our students to pillars for the hotline the court advocacy piece and the medical advocacy piece their brochures um, I know that's probably a lot to keep up with because pillars does some amazing work but their brochures are on that resource table so you all can grab some um, on your way out I want to now um, turn it over to Dr. Joanne Jenkins, who's going to um, talk to us a little bit about how Moraine Valley promotes an environment that is free of gender bias and sexual discrimination, and probably say a little bit about her role as our Title IX coordinator. Uh, thank you all. Can you all hear me? No? no? Yes? No, I kind of on. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming, and we appreciate it. Um, this is a good opportunity for you all to learn, um, especially our students, to learn what we do here at Moraine Valley as far as sexual assault, um, and harassment, and prevention. Um, here at Moraine, um, we have a very comprehensive Title IX policy. Uh, we have brochures um, to inform our students about what their rights are and uh, what the process is if uh, you are ever involved in some type of sexual assault or. Um, it witnessed sexual assault, so basically we have a policy. I didn't think, I don't have it on the resource center. This is our policy. As you can see, it is very comprehensive. It's 37 pages, but <laughs> we know that some students won't read all of that. We also have a short brochure, so I'll make some of these available. Um, so we um, do, um, I don't do this work by myself. I have my colleague, um, uh, Dean Kent Marshall, he's there, raise your hand, Kent. Um, he is the Dean of Students and Compliance <laughs> and Compliance Officer. And so we make sure, part of my role is to make sure that, um, that if a sexual assault occurs, to take interim measures to make sure that it stops immediately, and then I go farther and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, it's my responsibility to look at any patterns that we may have at Moraine Valley that are conducive or have a pattern of sexual assault to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, 
we have state and federal laws that we have to comply with as far as the um, sexual discrimination, harassment. But here at Moraine, um, we do it not just because it's a state and federal law, but we do it because it's the right thing to do. And we want to always promote a safe learning environment for all our students. So in doing that, um, we email, you all may have gotten it, uh, we ev ev um, for the new students, we email our sexual harassment policy. So if you don't have the book, um, we email it to all our students. And um, we um, also, on the website, there's a link under right to know, rights to know, and then our policy is always there. Um, in that policy, it has the definition, some of the definitions that um, Suzanne had talked about, but it also has the process of what you would do in order to file a, a complaint. So, but this is a fair and equitable process because, um, you know, we serve all our students. So we have the complaint and we have the respondent. So we also have a brochure that's similar to this for someone who may have been accused of um, preventing, uh, perpetrating a sexual assault on someone. So this is a fair and equitable process for all students. Um, we also have um, designated staff members in addition to Dean Marshall that have been trained. We've all gone through extensive training and we are required also to do additional training eight to 10 hours a year um, in these areas. So we have um, designated people who can refer you to either me or the resources. We have compiled a list of resources for students both on and off campus. We also have designated a confidential advisor, which is actually Suzanne Nasser. She um, is an advocate for our, um, and she has been trained in sexual violence, and the students can come to her if they don't want it to go any farther, or any of our counselors, they are there to provide the support for them if they don't want it to um, go any farther with this investigation. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. So again, just to kind of recap um, some of the points that um, Dr. Jenkins made, right, is um, we talked a little bit at the beginning um, about how um, sexual assault, and not just on college campuses, but in the general population as well, is really an underreported crime. And we talked about how students or people, survivors, are afraid to come forward. They're afraid of not being believed. Uh, they're afraid of the process. What does it look like? Or they don't know what the process of coming forward and reporting looks like, how long it takes. And what Joanne is pointing out, what Dr. Jenkins is saying to you, is here's who I am as the Title IX coordinator. Here's who Suzanne is and the rest of her team in the counseling department as confidential advisors. You can go and talk to them in a safe, supportive, confidential space. And if you wanted to know more or learn more about your resources and what support um, Dr. Joanne Jenkins' office can offer you, um, then we can offer you that information. Um, I do want to point out that the brochure she, um, yep, that we do have that on the resource table. We also have the one for the accused. Um, so uh, please, again, um, feel free to pick up those brochures on your way out. I just want to ask um, Dr. Jenkins to say a little bit something about the difference between us as a confidential advisor if they come and talk to us in the counseling department and how that differs if they were to confide in a paper or in person to their teachers um, that they are a survivor, what the difference is between a responsible employee and a confidential advisor. Um, uh, Dean Marshall and I also um, do training for all our faculty and staff members. Uh, they're considered um, responsible employees. That means that if um, you were come to your teacher or even um, a staff member or a library assistant and you tell them that you've been a victim of some type of sexual assault, then they are required to let me know. So I can follow up with the student and make sure that the student is safe and that it doesn't happen again, or to provide whatever interim measures, say it happened in a classroom, then uh, we wouldn't want you as a student to be in a classroom where someone has been um, abusive to you or sexually assaulted you. So um, they need to let me know, and we are under time constraint on how uh, the state and federal government has a time constraint on how quickly we have to respond. So we, have, we um, provide training to all our um, faculty and staff um, in order to let them know what the process is for letting me know um, and so I can follow up or one of my team to follow up with the sexual assault. Um, for, I'm sorry, what was the other question you said? Just the difference between a responsible employee mm -hmm. and a confidential yeah. advisor, thank you. So the responsible employee, as I stated before, uh, they have an obligation, they are required to let me know. 
um, if you come to them with any type of, um, or if you see you saw someone, they're required to let me know and we have to follow up with that student. Now, it doesn't have to go any farther than me, but the responsible employees are required to. The counselors, however, by the nature of their trade, um, that's confidential. They don't have to, unless there are a couple requirements. Um, if it involved a minor, if it involved a weapon, then they have to um, let us know. But um, by the nature of what they do in their licensure, um, you can go to them and confide in them and it, it goes no farther. They tell no one. Uh, now, if you decide to take the next step, then that's fine. But um, there is um, a place where you can go that's safe and you can just, if you just wanted to talk about it or receive additional resources, then the counseling department and the confidential advisor is the place. But if you tell anyone on campus, you know, that that um, don't that is not in the role of counselor, then they are required to actually um, tell me. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the difference between um, those two roles. So now that we've spent some time um, looking at what our community offers survivors um, se of sexual assault and what we offer in-house, um, I'd like for us to take a look at uh, when we think about what a survivor of sexual assault looks like or we think about the different reactions uh, to an assault, they really do vary, right? They vary based on the individual's life experience. And so um, I think um, Michelle, maybe Heather, and even Patty, if you all can um, address um, how does an individual's different life experience influence the reaction to being assaulted? How does an individual perceive no? We uh, mentioned that underreporting is a tremendous issue in sexual assault for survivors, but how does an individual perceive being told no or actually expressing no? A common myth in sexual assault is that the no is clear, it's physical, it's something that can be identified. But when we add in the complexities of life, w uh, being fearful of confrontation, wanting mm, to be polite, um, being afraid, being intoxicated, no isn't necessarily a very clear, bright line in the sand. So having life experience is going to alter or vary how an individual even perceives that moment or perceives saying no, expressing no, or interpreting it. Um, another, in, uh, I think an important aspect of life experience is attitudes towards the police department. Um, in law enforcement, we look at the investigative process as the sooner it starts, the better. The sooner we can start getting witness statements, the sooner we can understand from the victim who, what, where, when was involved, collection of evidence. Um, and sexual assault doesn't follow a specific timeline. Often we find that individuals who've experienced trauma don't recall facts in a straightforward or even linear way. We kind of bundle it up and oftentimes um, when we come forward to tell uh, even a friend or someone who we view in a role of authority, uh, details may be muddled, they may be blurry, and that can then cause a sense of, well, why don't I remember correctly? What did I do that I don't remember the incident correctly? And then even the individual may feel, did I drink too much? Why was I drinking too much? Why don't I remember? Um, and that's simply a variation that people respond to trauma differently. Um, and so if there is a perception that law enforcement can't be trusted or they're not going to believe me, people will be less hesitant to, they don't want to go to the police. They don't want to experience that feeling of, am I going to be in questioned? Am I going to face, to a certain extent, like detailed questions of what were you doing? How did you get into that position? Um, so therefore, life experience can then delay that reporting process. And again, from a law enforcement perspective, the sooner we start, the better, but that's simply not how sexual assault works. We find that um, survivors often remember more detail the more time that goes on. So I think that law enforcement um, 
understands this and we're working on training in this area, but it's certainly one way that we see differences amongst individuals, the reporting process, and then subsequent um, experience um, after that. To add on to what she said, um, another thing about life experiences, some victims um, don't realize necessarily something was wrong um, unless a certain situation comes up, they're talking to friends, they're talking to, and they think about something and they don't realize maybe that was something that classifies as something under the sexual assault umbrella. Um, in addition, th I know that there's a specific statistic out there that states that um, a lot of victims tend to know potentially the person that assaulted them. Um, so there's the fear of this person is someone I know, I don't want to get them in trouble, how is it going to affect our relationship after this? Um, in addition to, I don't want them to maybe go to jail, what's going to happen to them? Those are a lot of things that cross people's minds when dealing with the situation. Um, I saw you writing a lot, <laughs> and so I do want to um, turn it over to Patty, who can talk about reactions and uh, to an assault. Because I think I think what happens is we have this image in our head of what a survivor of sexual assault should look like um, after the incident. So if they're not crying, right? If they're not devastated, um, then we tend to it creates this kind of self doubt. I think well. They don't seem impacted by this. I mean, they're not tearful, they're not sad. You know, when in reality, a survivor's response to sexual assault is just as unique as that individual. So in the counseling department, right, we all work with individuals who come to us immediately after an assault. Some may wait a few weeks to tell their story. Some may wait months and others years. And we see people who come and are angry. We see people who are coming, they're confused. We see people who come and they're in shock, especially when that um, assailant, that perpetrator, right, was someone that they knew, right? So there's a variety of emotions and we have to be mindful of that. Nobody reacts. What I think is funny, you might not think is funny, right? We all react to situations differently and we have to be respectful of that and we have to be mindful that survivors of sexual assault, they come in with a wide range of emotions. I had one survivor say to me, I know I'm kind of like laughing and calling this weird. She's like, I just don't know how to deal with this. I don't know how else to react. This is somebody that she knew. She was assaulted by somebody she knew for a very long time. So I do want to turn it over. And the other thing I want to add is this thing about consent, right? Um, individuals, right, cannot consent if they are under the influence. Right, if they've had alcohol in their system, if they've had drugs, um, well, drug is an alcohol, right, but other kinds of substances, they cannot consent if they are under the influence. Um, so I know Patty's gonna have a lot to also add to this, so please. Um, another thing in regards to consent, um, anyone under the age, in, at least in Illinois, our Illinois sexual assault statute, which is, by the way, one of the strongest in the country, um, and uh, anyone under the age of 17 is unable to knowingly give consent to any sexual activity, uh, as well as um, persons with um, uh, either uh, physical or um, intellectual disabilities um, are not able to knowingly give consent. Um, what we, the importance of um, advocacy services in the emergency room um, our, all of our panelists are, are, and Suzanne are totally correct. Um, you will encounter no one survivor is the same. Um, you may have someone come in um, days later after a sexual assault with mulling over um, whether they, um, over the consent issue, right? Um, as well as someone immediately after a sexual assault. Uh, what we see is a variety of emotions. Someone could be laughing, someone could be very angry and swearing, someone could be acting very nonchalant about a situation, um, or sometimes I'm just sitting there um, with a survivor not saying anything. Um, so we have this kind of um, lifetime for women like script in our head of what a, what a stereotypical true rape victim is, and that is definitely not the case. And so the importance of medical advocacy in the emergency room right after someone experiences a trauma is providing someone with options 
to empower them to make their own decisions. A lot of control and power has been taken away in that situation. Uh, ensuring that their rights are being upheld. Um, ensuring that they have resources going forward. A lot of our survivors, um, and I don't want to you know, paint a broad brush or anything. Um, this is just my experience. Uh, I've been doing this for a very long time. And uh, many of, our, of the survivors that I'm, I'm just going to comment on the survivors that I've seen. Um, have experienced some kind of pre-assault type of discom discomfort where, you know, kind of that inner bell that goes off in your head? We're, yeah, we're like in I your instincts. And um, we're not, tr and we have experienced that in all situations, right? Not even just in a, a, a trauma situation where we blame ourselves for not trusting our instincts. And so a lot of our survivors felt like something was off or something was said or something was done. And so there's so much, bl you know, they blame themselves more um, than anything else. Also, the reaction of loved ones, significant others, the reaction of medical personnel or law enforcement, what are their reactions going to be to the situation that I'm in? So a lot of the survivors I've worked with were more concerned um, with how their mother was going to react to the situation than to what they were experiencing. So a lot of, a lot of kind of um, projection um, on, so um, the importance of, I'm just going to go again, on the importance of having an, a medical advocate present is so you're more comfortable going through a process when you have all the information needed to make informed decisions. Thank you, Patty. Jane, I think you would probably, yeah, if you could share. Um, being on this panel is exactly like what it feels to be like a victim of assault. And I'm just going to use the microphones as an example of what it feels like. If you guys had noticed when we came up, a microphone was put in front of everybody but me, the victim of the assault. And I think that's a great metaphor for what you need to be um, once you're assaulted. You've got to make that choice that you're going to grab the microphone and you're going to talk. And you also notice what happened is Dr. Jenkins immediately became an advocate of me when it came to my question. Because she had noticed, too, that my, when we were talking about victims, my na name was never even brought up initially. And she looked at me, and then she goes, here, here's the microphone. So um, that was exactly my experience. Um, certain things people have said have right on tar target. That pre-assault thing whole series of things were just odd, and they were just off. And um, I was assaulted by a stranger, so I didn't even know it was going to happen, but every hair on my head, and just a series of odd things, I won't, if you want to hear about I'll tell you afterwards, um, happened. Then um, next thing that was brought up is, is the healing is far from straightforward. Um, the, like, my assault happened 25 years ago, but I had definite issues around 9-11. Um, I was so angry because the rest of the world hadn't figured out that no one's safe at any time. And um, so, and today I'm good, I'm a badass, I'll say it. <laughs> We're an R-rated audience. I'm a true badass, and this is the experience that made me a badass. But I turn around and I look at my sister-in-law who was also sexually assaulted on campus. And my mom, who was also sexually assaulted on campus, talk about your 25% numbers, different generations of women who also have it. And I know my sister-in-law is significantly angry at, angrier at the world than I am. And my mom, I know it accounted for, and she told me that why she always feels more like a victim in life and shut down and doesn't quite have the power. Um, I don't. Um, the other thing is every single situation is completely different. And the other reason I really like this microphone um, setup was because the people in power all have microphones in, uh, in front of them. And they, it's just like when you're the victim of something, you know, it's like everybody else has done this before and they, they understand what's going on. But you as the victim don't. And that's why when Patty speaks about finding advocates, that's so incredibly important. Because, for example, when I was in assault, the police were like, you must go to the hospital. All right, well, I'm, I'll, I'm, you're the expert. I'll go to the hospital. And then the emergency room nurse pulls out the, the rape kit. 
And she says, okay, now we're gonna go and take samples. And I was never penetrated, but she then wanted to penetrate me after I felt so incredibly vulnerable. And it was my advocate who finally walk, was walking through the door and going, listen to your victim who does not want this. Um, but I, they, they take samples from other places, like under your fingers and things like that. And I was cool with that. And um, so it's important to do that. Um, and then last but not least was the sense of control and power really shifts after you've been a victim. And I, I know I kind of mentioned that. I took on a lot of power. I consider having been the victim of sexual assault one of the best things that ever happened to me. But I didn't believe that for the first two years after it happened. But now I know it made me a much better and stronger person. Okay. Thank you. You know, I really want to say, um, and I said this last week when Sharon and I presented, that survivors of domestic violence and survivors of sexual assault are really um, the most bravest people that I've ever met. And it does take a lot of courage, and it takes a lot of strength uh, for someone like Jane to come forward in a packed room like this um, to share her story, to tell her story, so that we all can... Um, not feel alone if we are survivors and so that we can also learn um, in this space together what it means uh, to be a survivor and a badass. <laughs> um, so with that said, um, you know, not everything's perfect, right? And so when we come forward um, to report we might have these expectations in our head of what that reporting process is going to look like. Um, so if we can just spend some time to unpack um, what um, are some of the problems or the challenges that currently exist um, in the legal system regarding sexual assault and offer up some improvements possibly. Um, Michelle, Jane, I don't know if you also went through the legal process and had some um, things to offer up. Um, so if either one of you would like to get us started, that would be great. Notice me grab the microphone again. Um, my experience with the legal system was that within two weeks of after the, the assault, they had kind of given up on the investigation of my situation. Um, it never went to trial. Um, and that alone is interesting to deal with, even this many years later. You know, you've got to learn in all of this that they're not going to solve every single case, they're not going to fix every situation, especially when it's a stranger assault. Um, but that's okay. You know, because everything has a really positive, you can, there's a movie out with uh, Will Smith called Look for the Collateral Beauty. And, and I've since had to deal with the legal system several other times for a variety of things. I think the best thing, if you're the person dealing with the legal system, is to try to always look for the collateral beauty in all of that is occurring. Because it is an incredibly difficult thing to make work a society that people follow the laws and laws are enforced. I would just add for the criminal justice students and those interested in how the system works, we're really at an interesting point when it comes to looking at laws. As Dr. Jenkins mentioned, here at the college we follow Title IX. That is a different process than the actual legal system and they have two different standards of evidence. Title IX uses the preponderance of the evidence, which means it's more than likely than not that the accusation or the event occurred. So essentially it's a lower standard, whereas the legal system needs more of that clear and confirmed or concise, that beyond a reasonable doubt, if you will, to move forward. Now we're seeing some political discussion that those processes might change, um, and it does have political overtones to it, but because they're two separate systems, that can be complicated. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's anything wrong with Title IX in and of itself, 
but the fact that it's confusing, it's very complicated. It was instituted, I believe, in 1972, and then got a little bit of a, a kick in the pants in 2011 when um, the Obama administration sent out a uh, what's known as a dear colleague letter and told the colleges and universities, you are going to pursue um, allegations of sexual assault. Um, otherwise, it is a violation of, of your student's civil rights and that there were going to be serious consequences to that. And now we're seeing political discussion that that may be rolled back. Um, so like I said, there's political overtones to it, but it's a complicated process. Um, and what we're seeing as a result of that, it being so complicated, there's discussion that were accusers treated unfairly, were they denied due process as well. Um, as Dr. Jenkins mentioned here at Moraine, we're very fortunate that the system looks to uh, protect everyone, um, victims, survivors, those accused. Um, but there's discussion right now is has the process worked in that regard? Um, so how that plays out, it'll be interesting to see. Does anyone else want to add to um, this question? I'll just add to it. Um, Professor Perlow, she's absolutely right. I just want to make clear that Title IX in the legal system is there are two separate processes. The college is required to investigate any, um, any reports of sexual assault. And then once we do that through that investigative process, um, when we talk to the survivor, or the person who is complaining or the complainant, then it's up to them. It can be the same process, it doesn't have to be. It's up to the complainant whether or not they want to pursue the criminal charges. So it's through that process, it's a process, and Professor Furlow was correct, it's a complicated process, but it's simple for you. Um, if you have um, a report of a sexual complaint or I mean, sexual assault, then you um, come to me and then we work through that process together. And um, it's totally up to the person who is bringing the complaint what the measures are, unless there are a couple of circumstances that are a different, uh, minor or weapon, those type of um, things. But um, we work through that process together, but there are two totally different processes. Let me just add one more thing. That's actually a tremendous benefit. Most of um, the, the research in sexual assault, why underreporting occurs, finds that actually reporting increases when the complainant has options. When because of whatever myriad of feelings that they may have, um, and uh, just simply being unsure how the process goes, um, when they have the opportunity to just, I just need to tell someone about it. Who should I tell? What should what should I tell them? and I don't know if I want it to go further, we found that reporting increased drastically. So to have that opportunity um, and uh, here at Moraine is a really tremendous benefit that I think needs to be acknowledged. It's, it's a really powerful tool that we have at our disposal. Yes, thank you. Thank you for making the distinction between what an investigation process looks like here at the college um, versus what it looks like if you were to pursue it out in like a municipality. So I think that's really an important distinction to be made. Um, Patty, I didn't know if you had anything to add to that um, and what court advocacy looks like at Pillars or anything at all? Um, well, Cook County is a very unique system. Um, when you uh, make a police report of sexual abuse or sexual assault, uh, when a detective determines that there's enough evidence to go forward with a case, they will call the assistant state's attorney's felony review department out to interview the survivor as well. And then that the assistant state's attorney will determine whether um, the sexual, that the assailant will be charged with sexual assault or another crime. Um, we have court advocates that, as I mentioned, um, Legal advocacy will come to the police department to inform a survivor and their families of, of what to expect in the criminal justice system, what that looks like. And then we have court advocates that work at Bridgeview Courthouse, Maybrook, uh, 26 in California, and 555 West Harrison. Um, and they will um, go for a survivor, um, go on behalf of them, uh, keep them abreast of what's going on with their court case, um, assist with writing victim impact statements, ensure that their rights are being upheld, um, are there for preparation for trial, and they're during the trial process. Um, so our advocates will go for survivors so they don't have to take off work, take off school, uh, keep seeing their offender, and then they will let them know what's going on with each court proceeding. Um, uh, the average length of a court case here in Cook County is about two years. 
um, and that's uh, uh, unless a case is, is plea bargained out. Um, I always tell people my longest case was about seven years, um, and it, it did end up having a, a good resolution. Um, but the importance of having an advocate there is that they can inform you of what's going on, um, answer any questions that you have, as well as always um, uh, hook you up with more resources and support within the community. Um, and yeah. so that's, that's yeah, that's it. that's perfect. Um, in a previous life, I actually used to be a court advocate for survivors of domestic violence, and I'll tell you, to be that middle person between the attorney and the survivor um, is really, as you pointed out, it, it has a lot of value. So we're really grateful that Pillars offers um, court advocacy. Um, for time's sake, and I think we already looked a little bit, you all kind of answered this question here. Um, I do want to turn it over um, to Heather a little bit to talk about her experience and her certification as a sexual assault nurse examiner and um, what does a medical forensic exam look like. Um, Jane touched on this a little bit. Patty, I know you talked about how Pillars offers medical advocacy. Um, and how a medical advocate and a SANE nurse works together. But Jane, if you could talk about your certification and what a SANE nurse's role is. Okay, so as um, we discussed, a SANE nurse stands for Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner. And these are registered nurses who are clinically prepared, educationally prepared um, to do examinations, talk with victims, talk with family members. Um, in addition to our best friends are going to be our medical advocates like Pillars. I primarily worked out in the western and north western suburbs um, in the emergency department. So Pillars is mainly for this area. So we worked with a different group of people. But absolutely, when I worked um, at Ingalls Memorial Hospital in their ER, Pillars was a, um, one of the options for victims. So these nurses um, pretty much are emergency room nurses, critical care nurses, um, maternal nurses, but you can be essentially a nurse in any situation that can be trained as a SANE nurse. Um, SANE nurses are meant for anti-violence and trained as just. Um, regarding the medical forensics exam, um, we discussed that a little bit. Now, um, these are all things we talk to victims completely and thoroughly and everything that is potentially going to happen. Um, there is a kit that is required to perform these exams. Um, they are mandated what's in them. There's a whole legal process that also goes along with it, but the um, kit itself, um, essentially, it has documents, it has swabs, it has um, papers all meant for collecting envelopes. Um, and this exam can range anywhere from an hour to several hours, depending on the victim, the patient, um, would like to do. We tell them everything that is going to happen. They have the choice, you have the choice, what things can and cannot be done, and different than the law in Title IX, we have, the medical field has way different um, legal legalities as well in that you essentially get to choose which things you are comfortable with and not. We talked about um, scrapings under nails. We talked about um, certain exams depending on what the patient would like to do. Um, who can request these? Now this kind of depends again state to state, but essentially anybody. Um, obviously, if this is for someone that's a minor, um, parents, family members, but regarding adults, anyone can request them, but it is up to the victim themselves of whether they want to go through with that or not. Um, and even when we get patients in the emergency department, uh, victims, people that come in wanting um, this kit, this examination performed, they can still refuse it at any point in time if they come in and say they would like to have this done. As medical professionals, we have to let certain people know, but it is entirely up to them as to what they have done. And um, this is also when a group like Pillars is fantastic. We call them immediately. We give you all the references you need. We discuss follow-up care, um, that it's an open, an open situation. 
Um, as far as the legalities I was talking about in this kit, um, once it's opened, it has to stay with a sane nurse. No matter what he or she is doing, once it's opened, the contents and everything in it is only witnessed by that nurse. And once we close it, it has to be witnessed by certain people as well. So um, sane nurses really have to be trained essentially in forensics in order to collect the necessary items. Thank you. Um, I want us to um, kind of try to wrap things up by talking about some of the recommendations um, you may have for family and friends who want to support um, survivors. And so with that, I'd like to start with Jane and what suggestions and recommendations may you have in terms of being a supportive person and an advocate? Number one, I think everyone in the entire college should have a 45 minute self-defense workshop. That, the fact that I had taken a 45 minute self-defense workshop made the difference between me um, being much more harmed or turning into a badass and doing what they said. So um, if I had my way, College 101 wouldn't even include a workshop on self-defense. And I teach self-defense in every single psych class because of that for a few minutes. Second thing is everybody in this room really needs to know that there is a counselor for everybody. When my thing happened, um, I was referred to the counseling center and the per first person I saw, there was no chemistry between us. I wish somebody had said to me, just make an appointment with somebody different because I think I lost two good years of my life because I didn't have a good counselor immediately after it. It took me about two, three years to resolve everything. And uh, I think it would have taken me two months if I had seen a counselor. So I'm a huge advocate of the counseling center here at Moraine Valley because there's a variety of different people with a variety of different styles and personalities. Um, third thing, listen, truly listen. Let the person talk and truly listen and don't try to fix them. A lot of times people just need somebody to listen so they can get the thoughts out of their head and understand and process what's happened to them. Um, expect the unexpected too from them. You'll, in my situation, I had suspected my mom had been assaulted in college, but didn't know that for sure. And I absolutely had no idea my sister-in-law had also been a victim of a rape in college by a known person. Um, and I guess that would be me, my stuff. That's super helpful to hear, um, and I appreciate that, especially, I think, all the parts, but mostly about uh, that connection with the counselor. And I think just about all of us in the counseling center will say to our students, look, if you don't feel like this is a good fit between the two of us, maybe come back for one or two more sessions, and if you're still not feeling comfortable with my style of counseling or we're not relating to each other, please make an appointment with someone else. Like Jane said, there is a counselor for everyone. Okay, so never give up. Don't lose that time. Um, Patty, I don't know if you wanted to add um, some information about what are some things that our students can say to loved ones um, who are survivors? Uh, what kind of support can they give them? What are s some language they can use? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the I think the first and foremost thing to say to a survivor um, when uh, someone first discloses their assault or past trauma is um, it wasn't your fault. Um, again, we're talking a lot of, uh, many people experience self-blame um, and victim blaming of themselves. Another thing is I believe you. I always tell um, my survivors when I'm, when I'm with them um, that I'm truly uh, honored that you're sharing this with me. Um, and I will do the best I can to find all the resources to support you through this. Um, uh, informing them of our hotline, uh, it's anonymous. Um, informing them that, um, that here on campus that there are resources here for you. Um, definitely seek out um, a therapist and a counselor that um, you connect with. Definitely. Uh, at Pillars, again, all of our services are free. Um, if you don't live in the area, call anyway. 
and we'll find resources for you wherever um, you live. Thank you, um, that was really helpful to hear as well. Um, what I'd like to do now is, um, if I can, if I remember what Troy told me to do, um, is I'd like to show you all, and some of you may have seen this before, but I thought it would be a um, nice way to close out. First of all, can we please give a round of applause to our amazing, amazing panelists. Thank you for bringing your expertise and your experience and your information um, to this space. Um, I think we all learned a lot. I know I learned um, something new as well. Um, so thank you to all of you. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, this is a public service announcement. We did this um, many years ago, a few years ago now, and probably three. And it was a collaboration um, with students on campus, uh, college administration, you'll see our college president here, our chief of police, vice president of student development, you'll see our faculty represented in this um, PSA. And um, let's, you know, let's, let's watch it, because I think it's a nice way to kind of um, close out the session, which, you know, is a bit heavy. Um, and this is just our way of letting you all know that uh, we care about you, that we believe you, um, and that we are here for you. At Moraine Valley, it's... <laughs> Maybe not. At Moraine Valley, it's on us to stop sexual assault. To change the way we talk about women. To be part of the solution and not part of the problem. To recognize if a woman can't or doesn't consent to sex, it's rape. It's on us to create an environment where everyone feels safe. To keep an eye on someone in a vulnerable situation. It's on us to get in the way before it happens. To let our friends know what is and what isn't acceptable. To stand up to those who tell us it's not our business. To never blame the victim. It's on us. All of us. All of us. All of us. To stop, stop sexual, sexual assault. assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. We have a few minutes for Q&A, so please don't just jump out of your seat just yet. I know most of you are in class until 1.45, so if there are any questions, we'd like to go ahead and take them from you now. Yes. Um, for contributions, you mean, or for your time? Labor, labor or time. Yes, we would prefer, actually, um, I mean, money is always good, <laughs> but um, actually at Pillars and all your other rape crisis centers across the state, uh, we value your time more <laughs> than the money. Um, the philosophy of the anti-rape movement um, is women and men helping each other, and so, to have a, the mandate of our funding to be a, rape, a certified rape crisis center in Illinois is that we have a viable uh, core of volunteers that act as first responders on our sexual assault hotline. So on nights and weekends, uh, your first responders are gonna be other well-meaning, caring, compassionate um, citizens. And so uh, all volunteers go through an intensive 40-hour sexual assault training and are supervised, supervised by staff provide uh, um, on, on uh, cons consistent guidance and continuing education. Um, also, men um, who are, uh, want to be active in the movement, um, I'm training to do, to co-facilitate uh, prevention education in junior highs, high schools, and college settings, um, and get, being engaged in our new male ally initiative, as well as uh, reaching um, other men and boys um, and community members and being more active um, in the issue of sexual assault. So come on up here and, and uh, I'll get your name. <laughs>
On that note, I'd like to invite if you uh, you have a question, but I'd also like to invite Carrie, if you wouldn't mind um, coming up here, in terms of being able to support agencies um, that provide work specifically uh, to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault, there is an event happening here on campus, and I'd like um, Carrie to talk about that. And there are brochures um, on the table for it too, but she's gonna go ahead and make an announcement. Yeah, my name is Carrie. I work at the Crisis Center for South Suburbia. We're a local domestic violence shelter here in Tinley Park. And I just wanna say, first of all, this was an incredible panel and you all, all are very lucky to have um, these fine folks up here sharing with you and giving you the resources. And Crisis Center is another resource. And I think that video, It's On Us, is um, a message that we all share here that we are all part of the solution. We all know somebody who's been touched in some way. And so we all wanna be part of this solution. And one of the ways we're doing that at Crisis Center is actually gonna be here at the Moraine Valley campus. And it's called Light Up the Night. It's our Dance for Awareness event on Saturday, October 14th. And what we're doing is October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so we're gonna light up the night in honor of victims and survivors of domestic violence here on campus. B96 is gonna be here. It's a five hour basically dance marathon um, that we're gonna have. We're gonna highlight um, survivors, victims. We're gonna raise awareness about this issue here on your campus and in our community. And one way that you can help is by coming and dancing, being part of it. It's $25, um, but we're also asking people Get your friends involved, tell them about what we're doing and ask them to support you. So it's kind of like a walk or um, you know, like Relay for Life or something like that where you sign up, you make a page, you ask people to learn about this issue and you ask them to support you in your dance marathon. So the website is www.ccssd4a.com and you can go there, there are cards and flyers, there's information about how to register and how to become part of it. Um, my phone number is also on there, so you can give me a call, or I'll be actually at the table afterwards. So we'd love for you to come and be part of it, help light up the night, help bring more awareness to these issues of sexual assault and domestic violence, and really come out and actually have a good time with us um, and celebrate the, the movement towards ending these mm -hmm. sort of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I actually used to work for the Crisis Center for South Suburbia, so did Sharon Brennan. It's an awesome agency to support, and um, they all are doing it in partnership with Women in Action, which is um, one of our clubs here on campus, and the advisor for that is Maura Visa. So you can see Maura Visa, a Women in Action student club member, Carrie, or pick up uh, the flyers for that. Um, we are kind of out of time. We're at 140.